Hi everyone. Um, we're just waiting for Ariel to join in a couple minutes and then we'll get started. Hope everyone's having a good day, a good quarantine. Ariel should be on in it in just a minute. So. Hi guys, for everyone who's just joining, we're just waiting for Ariel to join. It should only be a couple minutes. I hope everyone is, you know, safe inside, healthy right now with everything that's going on in the world. It's a scary time to be in. Uh, Eric, I can't approve that request because um, I'm going to have to put Ariel on when, once she joins. I can just send her a text really quick to make sure everything is okay and working. Um, sorry, just waiting for Ariel really quick. She should be on soon. Having a little bit of technical difficulty, but we'll get there. Hi, everyone. Let me see if I can send this to her from right here. There we go, send. Ah, there we go. Let me add. All right. I just sent her. There we go. Hi. Hello. Hi, how are you? So the one issue is I cannot hear you, Kayla. So, um, let's see. There That's we go. Good. Here we go. There you are. Awesome. Can so you hear before, me? Yes, I can. So Great. before we start, I just wanted to let everyone know down below there is a button that looks like cards with a question mark, and that is where you should submit your questions to. Amazing. Hey, Jen Bostick. Yay. Been loving your emails. Hi, Marius. This is so exciting. Um, so for those of you who don't know why the heck you're here, um, <laughs> hey, Ron, this is so distracting for someone like me. I'm, it's gonna, I'm gonna try to stick on topic. Um, this IG Live is part of our Musicians Masterclass, which is a, is a PR masterclass, which because of this horrific pandemic, we are offering for free. I know a lot of musicians are struggling right now. There's a lot of question marks. I think we're all feeling in the entire industry, all of a sudden we got whacked, whacked upside the head as did the whole world. And I wanted to offer at least something that we can be doing during this time. Um, I love that I've seen so many musicians and artists are continuing to live stream, are continuing to put music out. Clearly, we're not going to stop making music just because there is a pandemic. I think, on the contrary, artists are going to be making more music than ever before. And a lot of our clients and friends and people on our mailing list started asking me a few weeks ago, should I hold off on my release? What should we do? And I think that it's a smart strategy to forge ahead 
Um, obviously, there's more people online now than ever before because we're all locked up in our houses and we're just using social media, obviously, with social distancing much more to connect together. So hopefully everyone that is joining this IG Live is aware that you have been invited to the Cyber PR Musicians Masterclass for free. Um, there is a link in the bio here. You can also find information out at cyberprmusic.com. There's a, a button there. Come join us in the class. It's three videos. Today's IG Live is focusing on part one which is all about how to prepare for a music publicity campaign. Throughout this course, I'm giving away a slew of what we call action sheets. I have printed the big one that we're gonna go through today. Um, and that's the one that I created specifically for this course, which is all about creating your media pitch. And there's some other ones. There's my ultimate guide to music publicity, which is a book that I wrote that you get with this course. Um, there is a color guide for those of you that are thinking about rebranding. We talk, we take you through the colors and hopefully you'll bring up some of the other action sheets if you need clarification today. This gorgeous woman here on the <laughs> screen with me is Kayla. She is our amazing director of graphics and design here at Cyber PR. So if you've ever worked with us on a website or had social media management, you've probably um, spoken with her. And um, she yes. is helping me moderate today because I get so overwhelmed with everything. Um, I see so many people I know and I'm loving watching you all here. Yeah, so, everyone's yeah. just kind of saying, hey. <laughs> Kayla, do we have any questions that um, have started pouring in? If not, I can obviously take us through some of the action sheets. Sure, so we have a couple questions from Instagram DMs. Um, so the first question was from, at sir underscore hick um and he wanted to know a little more about how he can you know join a tribe and grow his fan base so in this course i talk about in week one part one before you're going to go and do pr it's really important to have a fan base why unfortunately music journalists music bloggers uh podcasters playlisters internet radio station programmers for the little of that left, they are looking to see if you have a fan base. And so obviously growing your tribe is crucial. How do you do that? I always say start at home. I think we get really intimidated by the numbers on social media and there's a billion and billion here, a billion there. And we go into this panic mode about wanting to get as many hundreds of thousands of people following us as we humanly can online. You know, we live now in a world where a million followers is like a normal number. That's not normal. So you definitely have a tribe, even if your tribe is only 10 or 20 people to start with, start at home. Start with your artists that you have played on your record. Start with your producers. Start with your friends that support you. Start with family members. Start at home. And then from there, go out. Um, obviously, if you are making music and have been making music for quite some time, you have fans. Talking to them as much as possible across social channels, looking at what they're doing, not just having this one-way conversation on your socials is a great way to build your tribe tagging people that you admire and like um, is a great way to build your tribe. Making sure that, especially now, we're in the middle of a really sad, crazy time. I know that my social channels, in the worst case scenarios, they're full of people that are actually experiencing death. And in the moving down from that horror show, a lot of us are experiencing sadness, isolation, feeling just off. A lot of us are grieving, um, and we're not really talking about that right now. A great way to grow your tribe is to be empathetic and be with them. So if you see that someone is ha having a bad day, or if you see that someone is hurting, or if you see that someone is talking about something that's really meaningful to them, have a one-way conversation. Say, I I'm here for you, I feel you. And, and think less about promoting yourself and more about connecting with people. So I think that 
that is something to really, really think about. It's, it's tribe building one-on-one. If you look at how anyone has a fan base and you think about, you know, what is it that they're connected to? And this goes for like the giant superstars right on down. Now with social media, they're all taking the time to care back. So now's a good time to care back. I hope that's helpful. Of course, there's the tactical ways of doing that. I don't wanna spend a lot of time on tactics today. Um, Kayla and I actually put together um, for a live broadcast that I'm doing tomorrow for Intuit QuickBooks for small businesses. We found a lot of great tutorials for how to set up social media channels. We're gonna share that with the group um, just so if you do have specific questions about the technical side of social media, we're, we're here to help. We also have 300 articles on our blog that if you wanna do a deep dive, um, please feel free to go to cyberpurmusic.com, peruse our articles, you can search by any topic and I'm pretty sure you're gonna find something that could be helpful. Yeah, so Scrap Arts Music just asked uh, if that kind of connection could be done through a DM and I just want to say that yeah, definitely. Um, having real conversations often more, more often happens in a direct message. Um, I mean, especially, you know, uh, Catherine Porter, who's an artist that we represented in a band a couple of years ago, she very sadly lost her sister um, just last week to COVID. And she wrote this beautiful post, a beautiful tribute to her sister. It popped up on her Facebook. And of course you leave, you know, deepest sympathy. I feel bad. I'm sorry. You know, I hate to hear it. Um, but I think a DM is a, is a great way of going deeper. So I, that's, that's a really nice thing to do. It's a considerate thing to do, especially when people are hurting. They might not see in the 900 comments that come in of, of like a heart emoji. Um, if you have something deeper to say, DM is a fabulous way to do that. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more questions from DM. Um, I saw that Show Me Christ Records actually just joined um, and they had asked, do these methods work for record labels as well as independent artists? That's a great thing to think about. Um, if you think about record labels traditionally through the years, many of them are faceless and it's just like, I don't even know what label that is. And then many of them have a very strong brand. If you think about Capitol Records, that's the one everybody knows. They know what the building looks like. They know the artists, iconic artists, Sun Records um, would be another example. Um, I think if you are branding yourself and I imagine considering your handle, you probably do worship music or gospel music or music that's related to religion. I think that's really appropriate for you as a label to show a brand and to show love. I think that's very cool. Oh, hi, Howard, all the way from <laughs> Canada. Yay. <laughs> awesome. Um, so another question is from Jeannie Niokos. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. And she asked, how does one market oneself when they're involved in so many different things? Um, she extended that to say she used to think she should keep her, you know, live performing and her living stuff separate, but she's not sure. Okay, so probably you haven't gotten around to watching the whole video for the Cyber PR Lab, which this Q&A is all about, the music publicity course. And in it, I talk about this at length. I talk about when you're trying to shape your story as an artist, the pros and cons of adding your life into it. You know, do you have a day job that you want to talk about? Do you talk about um, other things in your life, other things that are happening to you? It really is a personal choice. I think many musicians feel strange doing that. I know we represent a couple of artists who are lawyers or doctors. You know, they don't feel like they want to alert the world that they also have this other life. But I think now more and more, if you are trying to bond with your fans, I think it's very hard to have a completely separate life that's like, okay, I go do my day job over here and then I do my creative life over here. So I am very much a fan of collapsing the two. Your art and your music probably are an expression of yourself and therefore bringing those things in, I think can be a very heartwarming 
way of expressing yourself. Another thing that I talk about in the lab is social media themes and music themes in general. As a musician, it's important to think about your brand and think about what it is you want to be saying. So for example, is your brand about the fact that you live in a specific location, Nashville, New York, Hawaii, wherever you live, do you want that to be part of your brand? Is your brand part of what you're expressing in your music? Maybe you're a healer. Maybe your music is funny. Maybe your music is uh, very specific to a niche. The brand should go in alignment with that. And what happens when we get on social media, we see things we like, we see articles we like, we see links we like, we see videos we like, we see politics that we probably don't like, but maybe we do like. And all of a sudden we're all over the place with, with, with commenting and with looking at things. You can go down the rabbit hole so quickly. The shiny object thing really will come and grab you. I think it's very important to try to stay on brand, whatever that brand is that you choose. So we talk about choosing between three and five niches and to try to stay within those social media themes. So I think if you keep it tight and narrow, it gives you more flexibility to enhance and strengthen your brand. And I think very much your day job, your life, can very much be part of your brand if you feel like it's not exposing you too much. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have one more question from Joel Lavioletti. Um, and he asked if you have any recommendations for models or roadmaps in building a system where a steady output would build up fans and followers. So basically he was saying that he doesn't have, you know, a big album to be promoting. I think he's more going the singles, slow release kind of route. So by output, you mean album? No, I think by output, he means singles. Got it. Okay. Um, Kayla, as the social media director here at CyberPR, I think I'm going to, I'm going to lob that one over to you. <laughs> All right. Um, I mean, I, we live in a singles world. So definitely singles are the way to go right now. And if you are eventually going to release an album, having a bunch of singles behind you is great because it's a good way to not only grow social media, but grow Spotify listeners. Um, and doing music videos, using snippets from those videos on socials, just promoting it out there. That would be my best recommendation for how to do that. Yeah, I would, I would add on to that, that obviously having a steady output is really important. Um, and what we always say here at Cyber PR when we're helping artists roll out their campaigns and when we write long-term marketing plans, the cool thing about having a steady output and putting singles out, and I know Lab One and what this Q&A is mostly about is publicity and getting music publicity, but the thing that's super cool about putting out tracks and doing that consistently is every time you put out a track, you can have a different goal in mind for that. So for example, let's say you're putting a track out, where are we? We're in April now. I don't even know. What to do <laughs> I know what that let's say you're putting a track out in May. So you're going to put one out in May, one in June, one in July. Um, May. Choose what it is you're going to focus on for that first track. Do you want to focus on using that track to build your YouTube channel because you've created a great video for it? Maybe you want to do a premiere on YouTube. Maybe you want to drive your fans on your mailing list to subscribe to you on, on, on your YouTube channel. Maybe you want to put a couple of dollars into YouTube promotion. Maybe, you know, that's what you're going to do in May. Then in June, let's say um, you're putting out a, a summer jam. You want to think, okay, I think this would go really well on some Spotify playlists. Um, and you could use June single for Spotify and think of how am I going to build my Spotify followers? Maybe do a Spotify pre-save. Um, spend much more time um, focused on Spotify, pinging Spotify on your social media. Go pimp out your Spotify profile read some articles about best practices for Spotify promotion, watch Spotify's videos. And June, you're going to focus on Spotify. 
and then July, maybe you'll focus on something else. So this consistent output of different singles, what I love about it is you don't have to feel like your pants are on fire and you have to go do everything. I have to do Facebook, I have to do Twitter, I have to do Instagram, I have to go do everything. Blah, blah, blah. No, focus on one thing and each single has a purpose. Of course you do put your single across your social channels and you do promote them everywhere, but one single, one focus, is a very smart strategy and it will also give you some freedom it will make you feel like you have breathing room and you don't have to go do everything every single time you put something out yeah so i hope that answers that awesome so i think that was it for now if you want to i see, i've been seeing a lot of questions flying through the, the comments yeah there, there are, are a couple um yeah. Um, I did see one, someone said, uh, <laughs> hi, Nadas. Um, <laughs> someone said, um, is it still a smart idea to invest in radio promotion? Yeah. Um, okay, so there is a lot of different types of radio promotion. Um, any of you that know us at Cyber PR know that we are not massive fans of radio promotion unless it's for something specific like specialty local radio is something that we really do like here. Um, the Nadas just came on board. They can speak to that. They're from Iowa and they get a lot of local radio that's known them for years and they can leverage something like that. I don't think that a national commercial radio campaign for an independent artist is a good use of your money ever. Um, I think also with COVID, thinking about what is going on right now, most people listen to radio in their cars. Most of us are not in our cars right now. We're at home. Um, so you might want to think about, you know, how many people are really listening to radio at this very moment. Um, and so I think that you have to be really thoughtful about your radio strategy and there's probably a better use of your financial investment in this day and age. I would say investing in Spotify playlisting could be a better use. Investing in marketing or social media could be a better use. The other thing I don't love about radio campaigns is it's very hard to get, get, gain real fans unless you're, you know, Gaga or Ariana Grande and you're just on the radio all the time and people hear you consistently on commercial radio. Um, it, I don't think a lot of people are listening to um, local radio and then racing to the computer to try to find out who you are and then following you on social channels. Right. Um, someone just said, how do I get my music in front of music bloggers? Uh, CyberPRMusic.com. We are talking about the music publicity course. That is what this whole course is about. Please come and sign up and I will give away all of that. I spill all that tea in the videos that you will get for free when you sign up to the lab. Yeah. So, um, oh, hold on. Yeah, I saw a couple other questions. Like, yeah, by. there was one from the Pat Williams group asked, what's the best way to build a following when going from being solely a backing musician to a solo artist? Very cool. Um, so um, first of all, does the backing musician position in your life, who are you backing? Do they have a following? Is it okay with the person, people that you played with for you to leverage their followings if they exist? Start there because that is going to be a community of people who at least have seen you. They know you. They've seen you on stage, perhaps. Um, we worked for a band. Um, a lot of the guys uh, in the band were in Billy Joel's band. You know, it was very easy to find Billy Joel fans and say, here is a band you might be interested in because you're a Billy Joel fan. Um, so that could be one way to do it. Start with the fan base that's already in existence. If that's not the case and you have a lot of experience with other playing with other bands and you're, you're um, jumping out on your own, um, finding obviously other artists that have the same sound as you. Like if you think, I always like to say, if you are going to be played on a Spotify playlist or played on the radio, 
what would come directly before and what would come directly after you. Those are the fans that you want to try to capture. So it's little things like when you make your Facebook um, profile, it says bands that we are, um, Fabrizio in Italy, hello. Bands that we are influenced by or sound like, you know, getting, getting into those tribes, making your fans and people that even come across you casually on social media understand that, you know, if you like, Iron and Wine, perhaps you will like me. If you like Megadeth, perhaps you will like me. If you like Ingrid Michaelson, perhaps you will like me. You know, getting people to understand what the genre and the feel is. Fabrizio Paterlini just joined. Um, he's a beautiful new age ambient pianist. And, you know, he, we know exactly, like if, if you like Oliver Arnold's, you're gonna love Fabrizio. So for example, so it's understanding the wheelhouse that you fall into and looking at what are those artists doing? Where are their fans congregating? Of course, fans are congregating everywhere, but taking a look at how others are doing it and I wouldn't say copying, but garnering some tips from the people that are already, um, are already firing away would be a good thing to do. Cool. Um, so the R Train band asked, what about timing in the present situation? Do you wait for the virus to pass or do you move forward anyway? I'm of the mindset, um, I, for those of you that are on my newsletter or have been on my blog, this is my first day out of maternity leave. Um, why? We got to move forward, guys. We all got to move forward. Um, it is, it's time. I don't think sitting on anything at this point is a great strategy. This thing is unfortunately not going away for a long time. Um, I know Lady Gaga pulled her album release back, but many, many people have not, if you want to look at how the superstars are doing it. Um, you might want to re-strategize a little bit, but I would say put it out, plan it a little bit. But, I, you know, I think if we're waiting and waiting and waiting, the news, the deluge of horrible news is not going to stop, unfortunately, anytime soon. I know that we're all kind of sheltering in place for at least another four weeks here in New York and in other big countries, big states um, and cities. I think no time like the present. Just do it, you know, but plan, but plan, you know, don't just press the button tomorrow and then go, oops, I should have thought about how I was going to roll that out. Right. Um, I do want to um, talk a little bit about this masterpiece of an action sheet that I put together for Cyber PR Lab One, which is what this Q&A is all about. For those of you just joining us and you don't know why we're here answering questions, this is part of an ongoing free series that I have just made free. It's a masterclass for musicians and anyone in the music industry looking to get music PR, and in it you get 13 and now more action sheets. Um, and there's action sheet 1.4, which you'll find when you sign up, go to cyberparamusic.com or the link here in the bio at Instagram. This is all about creating your media pitch. And this is obviously the cornerstone of music PR. And it's something that so many artists don't do well because unfortunately they think that just the music is gonna speak for the result. And sadly in this day and age with the busyness of music bloggers and podcasters and, and everyone creating music publications online, no matter what flavor they are, getting them to pay attention is the hardest part of the puzzle. How are they gonna pay attention? They're gonna pay attention if you take the time to structure a pitch that is compelling, that speaks to them, and that has a story. So in Lab One, I talk a lot about how in today's day and age, it is no longer acceptable to have what we used to call a musician's bio. And a bio, when I started back in the 90s, early 90s in music PR, um, you would have this long bio that would say something about, you know, how you learned to play your instrument, you went to a certain school and maybe studied music or you didn't. Um, and then you talked about, you know, your accolades, the history of your art, and you kind of go through a CV. 
which is fine and important. And I think everybody does want some context and some history, but that is not how people are going to be attracted to you. That's not how the media is going to be attracted to you. So this action sheet really helps you focus in on a specific nugget, something that they're going to be um, captured by. And what it does is it walks you through the genres you play, artists that you like or sound like, um, different types of your signature story woven in different ways. So um, depending on who you are, Happy Ron is on with us. He has a beautiful signature story about his personal mental health condition and how he lives his life and navigates that. He has another signature story about being from San Diego and how that has been part of, part of who he is. And he gets the local media to pay attention to him in really exceptional ways because he's excellent at understanding how to pitch locally. Um, so then we talk about feelings that you want to evoke from your music. Putting that into your pitch is critical. My music is joyful. My music is soulful. My music is, you know, meant to be listened to with the windows rolled down when you're driving on a country road. I don't know. What is the vibe that you want to evoke? You want to talk about that. Um, and then you want to also think about assets. Um, what about the song is special. Was it produced by someone? Did someone play on it? Is it a tribute to something? What is the, is the, is the nugget about the specific song that you're pitching? Is it to commemorate something? The Nadas are on this live stream. They have a beautiful song that they wrote. Um, one of them has a son who is autistic and um, we, we, we helped them promote it and it, we did it during national autism month. And it's about Henry James. That's the name of, of, of their son and um, we got a lot of media attention and special specific blogs that are writing about children and autism and the reality of what autism is like in today's day and age, for example. So these are all things that could be, um, could be part of your pitch. And then we also, that's what we call a niche pitch. And then we also um, talk about what you need to prepare for your pitch. So it's not only having a strong, written pitch. It's about having very, very good assets. For example, a great photograph, a good looking uh, cover art for your single. Um, you want to have a web presence that doesn't suck because the media, when they come to see you, they're immediately going to go on your Instagram. They're going to go on your Facebook. They're going to go to Twitter, wherever they like to eat across socials, and they're going to check you out. So you want to make sure that your social media house is in order. And you want to make sure that you don't look like a noob in the eyes of the media. So it's very, very important to do. Um, and then you want to also make sure that you are proficient with SoundCloud. Um, we're going to be talking about this in part two of the lab and um, why. SoundCloud is what music bloggers still to this day use, why the embed code it's much easier to grab a SoundCloud embed code because SoundCloud doesn't make you log in. You can go straight to the music blog, you can press play and you're streaming the, the music. Um, and if, if you're only sending, for example, a Spotify li a link, that is harder for music blogs to work with because people to use Spotify have to be logged into it. It's an annoying barrier to entry. So understanding when you're doing music publicity, the language that music bloggers like to speak is in fact, SoundCloud. So that is the um, action sheet 1.4, which you'll get when you sign up to the Music Publicity Masterclass Lab. Again, it's here on our profiles and on cyberpiermusic.com. Um, please do watch the video, work yourself through those action sheets. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to get through each week. I hope you get some deep insights. Yeah. Do you want to answer a couple more questions? I would love to. And I'd also love to grab that glass of water, which I can't reach. So Go ahead. Reach, I'll grab my water. <laughs> okay, we're back. <laughs> okay. So Hitman Blues Band said they took the Spotify course. Woo. 
Uh, they got streams and followers now, but how do they capitalize on that with PR? Um, so definitely, if you've got good streams and big numbers on Spotify or on any other social channel, it is certainly worth noting when you're going to pitch for PR. So if you have a formidable, for example, Fabrizio, who's on this, this live stream with us, he has over 2 million plays on Spotify. I think it might even be more than that. Forgive me if, if I'm not remembering correctly. I have new mom brain. But the idea here is that's an impressive number. Um, any number over 100,000 is pretty impressive, I think. Um, but depends on your niche, of course. Um, so mentioning it in your pitch, we have X amount of plays on Spotify. We have X amount of followers on Instagram. You know, whatever is impressive, that is something that makes a journalist understand, oh, this artist is worth writing about because other people are, are, are liking it somewhere, are listening to it somewhere. So definitely that's a very good thing to add to your pitch. Of course, it's not the whole thing, unless of course you break the internet somehow and you've done something that gets so much attention. Um, then yes, you could certainly lead with that as your pitch, but it's definitely a great talking point and a good nugget to throw into a media pitch is anything that you're doing that's impressive on any social channel. Yeah. Um, Allison Clancy asked, what's the number one noob mistake people make when they first start pitching outlets about their music? Um, I think the biggest mistake is actually thinking that the outlets are gonna write you back or care, um, they won't, they don't. This is why we actually talk about Submit Hub quite a bit in our class, um, in our lab. Submit Hub is of course not for every genre and every artist. There's limited choices. For example, I know there's a Hitman Blues Land. I imagine you make blues music. Not a huge amount of music blogs in Submit Hub are covering blues music. There are some. Um, if you are making more trendy music like EDM or hip hop or chill wave or emo singer songwriter, you will do much better in Submit Hub. Um, and the thing I do like about that platform is you do pay a little money to pitch, but they are obligated to write you back. So you at least get a yay or a nay, you get some feedback. Um, so the biggest mistake I see artists make, it, it's twofold. It's one, they think that you know they're going to email these writers one time and they're going to hear back you won't you have to hear back you have to write them multiple times follow up multiple times that would be the first thing the second thing is just buying a media list somewhere of like a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand names and blasting it out is a terrible mistake that artists make for your consideration dear sir hello there hi there Anyone opening that kind of email knows that you did not do your homework and that you've just vomited out an email. That is what the media will love to delete very, very quickly. So that noob mistake of just, I want to get as much PR as possible, therefore I'm going to send as many emails as possible to try to get as, cast a wide net, awful idea. What I would rather see you do and what we talk about in week three of the course when we talk about curating our media lists is choose 10 people that are the perfect people for you. Write them individually, follow them on social media, read what they're writing, make sure that you understand this is the person that I want to have pay attention to me and go after that person. It's just like dating or meeting a new friend. You, you have to be appealing specifically to that person. Or they're not going to want to be your friend or date you. It's the same way when you're pitching. And it takes work. That's why we as publicists have a job. Is because we're the ones that have to curate those lists and put those, those emails together and those pitches together. Um, so I think... Knowing your audience is the key. And the, the new mistake number one I see musicians make is this, you know, sending it out to hundreds of people. Concurrently, even if you're using Submit Hub, just searching for the genre and like clicking submit, 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 submit is a great way to lose $40, $50, $60 very fast. 
unfortunately, you have to go look at the website, look at the blog, see if it's appropriate for you, then press submit. Because otherwise, you might just be wasting your dollar. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a Dan Music uh, asked, is four singles a year a good quantity or not enough nowadays? Really depends on your audience. I think that... <laughs> You know, there's no magic number for anything in the music business. Anyone that tells you there's like, a, here's the formula, there's no formula. The formula is what your audience wants, likes, and can bear, plus how much music you actually have, plus, you know, can you afford to put out a lot of music or create a lot of music? You know, some of us go into the studio and we work with producers and mixers and masters and wonderful musicians and that costs money. And you might not be financially able to create and put out music every single month, even though you might want to. So four, music, four, four tracks of music, that's a great number. Um, Spotify recommends that you, I mean, you cannot submit for Spotify playlisting consideration if you're using the Spotify platform uh, more frequently than every four weeks. I think for four songs, that's gonna be tight. I think if you have 12 songs, every four weeks is great. I think if you have four songs, every six to eight weeks, I think is a good amount of time. Like I said earlier in this Q and A, choose a reason for each one of those singles Maybe it's YouTube, maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's building up your mailing list, maybe it's Spotify, maybe it's um, an advertising strategy that you want to try with Gmail, with Google AdWords. You know, each single should have a different purpose and vision. Um, so experiment, see what goes with what. But four singles is plenty, and, you know, that'll get you through another several months. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the die sound asked, is hiring a publicist worth your investment and how long before an album release should they hire? Oh, gosh. Uh, for those of you that know me and have been following me for years as a recovered traditional publicist, um, I don't always think that hiring a publicist is worth the investment. We don't think that way at all here. Um, the reason why we don't think that way is it's expensive and publicists tend to make promises that don't end up being true. I think a lot of times people hire traditional music publicists when they're independent artists starting out because they think that that's somehow going to move them to the front of the line somehow. And in some cases, if you hire the right publicist who's very good at strategy, that's absolutely the case. However, most PR firms, if you're a totally independent musician, you don't have a major distributor or a label or a manager that is a, a named manager, you can spend a lot of money and get really, really disappointing results. There's so much you can do on your own. I would say don't even attempt to hire a publicist until you've worked your way through lab one and you've watched all three videos and you've done the action sheets and you've got an understanding about what we're talking about. However, I have of course seen wonderful publicists that do great work. I would say it really goes on a case per case basis. But if you are just starting out, if you have fewer than 10,000 followers, if you're a CD baby artist or a tune core artist, and this is the kind of artist we work with all the time, understand that foundationally, you need to build yourself before you're going to go and get major PR. Um, even if you go to Submit Hub and you click on some of the larger websites that have larger followings, you might not get accepted simply because you don't yet have enough streams or enough followers. So unfortunately, in a lot of cases, um, these music blogs go by how many followers and what the fan base looks like in addition to what does the music sound like. So just being good enough, unfortunately, in this day and age of the music blogger thinking, well, what is that artist gonna give to me are they going to retweet me? Are they going to put me on their Facebook, on their Instagram? Are they going to promote that I 
helped them? Are they going to drive traffic to the premiere if I post it? That's a question that all of these music bloggers are actually asking. So as publicists, when Kayla and I are going to pitch music blogs and we go, yeah, they've got 150 followers, that music blog is moving on to the next person that's going to give them. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jenny Carr Singer asked, I think this is a great question. Uh, how can they find good charities to partner with for a release that is of the time? So like has to do with what's going on right now. Yeah, um, there are so many right now. I would, I would try to work with one that is music centric. Why not? We're, we're in the music community. I would love to point you to sweetrelief.org. They've put together a COVID fund for musicians who are suffering already and will be suffering from this horrible pandemic. And it's specifically for musicians. World Hunger Year, which was founded by Harry Chapin and is backed by a lot of major musicians like Bruce Springsteen, is not specifically helping only musicians. It's helping people that are um, short of food. They figure out how they're going to get food to people who are perilously close to having empty refrigerators during this time. Um, of course, Music Cares. There's a lot of charities. Um, I know a lot of the celebrities are doing um, fundraisers for um, a lot of the specifically um, charities that are helping to feed kids in public schools in America. We know that's a huge problem. I know here in New York City, one in five kids gets their breakfast and lunch exclusively from the school. So when you close the school, the kids literally are starving. So plenty of places to align with. Um, also, if you are trying to align with a charity, I, I do see a rookie mistake and even an advanced mistake that artists tend to make is they reach out to the charity and they're like, hey, I wanna do a benefit stream or a benefit concert or I put together something for you. What will you do for me? Nine times out of 10, charities are exhausted. They're overworked. They're underpaid. The people that work there, especially now in a pandemic where everyone's just trying to do the best they can do. Instead of trying to get the charity to have a meeting with you or get on board with you and somehow throw that concert anyway or that fundraiser, whatever it is you're going to do, raise your money and then send it to the charity and say, Here's what I did. Thank you. It's No Kid Hungry. Um, no Kid Hungry is the charity that is helping. Um, raise money for No Kid Hungry and then send it and say, I had a concert for you. Don't worry about if you did or didn't get in touch with that person. The smaller charities, um, and Kayla can share the link to our 25 uh, music charities that we wrote a blog post about it years ago um, and that's been refreshed every year that you might want to look at if you're considering um, helping a charity. I think that's a beautiful thing to do right now. Um, everybody can use help. And it's nokidhungry.org if you'd like to look, look into that. Yeah, absolutely. So I can put it on our story after this with a swipe up. <laughs> Sorry, to that blog post. Um, yes, and uh, Jenny's asking, what about Sweet Relief? Absolutely, Sweet Relief. Sweet Relief's <laughs> board. Um, disclaimer, I sit on their board. I have to always say that. Um, proud board member for many, many, many years. Um, Sweet Relief was and is and has been doing great work for, for the music community since the early 90s. Um, definitely check them out. Um, and their covid uh, coffers are running low already. So yes, if you'd like to give money, you know, it really depends on who it is you want to help. You want to help musicians, you want to help kids, you, you could help pets. I mean, there's, everyone needs help right now. It's just an absolutely awful time. Yeah. On a lighter note, <laughs> uh, Stephen WM asked about best practices for subject lines to get opens for pitches. We do talk about that in the course. So definitely you want to focus on um, what we talk about in, I think it's week one. We have three specific pitches that we show you um, for three of, three of our artists that we've worked with here at Cyber PR. And we actually walk you through the exact subject lines that we use to get publicity. So do take a look at that. 
Um, and there's actually, I think, even a link to, there's a HubSpot guide that we love about effective um, titling. How do you make a good title for your, um, for your pitch so that it does get open and does not end up in the, in the garbage bag? Perfect. So we have about five minutes left. We probably have time for another question or two. Uh, Lil Darling Music asked how you would recommend pitching to other musicians for collaborations. Great one. Um, again, every musician is on Instagram. I, I, I heard an artist say this years ago, and I think it's so true. Instagram is the musician's LinkedIn. I would say hit that artist up with a DM on Insta or whatever. They t you can tweet at them. Um, look, don't try to get Jay-Z to collaborate with you. Obviously, I would say try to try to do the best you can do. Like, you know, don't don't shoot too high and then be upset if you don't hear back from, you know, a massive household name. Um, and also understand a lot of artists do like to get paid for collaboration. So if you are trying to get someone's attention, make sure you've got a budget for that. Um, but I would say, um, honesty is your best policy. Hit them up on a DM, tweet at them, talk to them on Facebook. If you can message them, cause you can message anyone on Facebook and you know, you might want to say, I'm very serious about this. I'd, I'd love to collaborate with you. Here are the reasons why flattery will get you everywhere. And Kayla and I have noticed, you know, musicians do read their direct messages on Instagram. So I think that's a great place to start. Yeah, definitely. Um, Solitaire Music said that radio stations like KCRW or KEXP ask not to send follow-ups. So how should they act there? You know, if they say not to send follow-ups, the dumbest thing you could then do would be send a follow-up. Um, so I'm speaking about, you know, tradi more traditional printed press or music blogs you'll see in the course lab one, which is why we're all here. Cyberpr.music.com. Come sign up for free. Um, we talk about our three strike policy at cyber PR, where you follow up with a journalist or a music blogger three times. Of course, if specifically it says, follow, just send it one time. You look like an idiot if you send it and keep hitting the person back up. So follow the rules that they, they set forth. That's also, again, why we love submit hub. You submit it once, and if they accept it, great. If they reject it, great. Either way, you get an answer or you get your dollar back. So well worth the investment. Thank you very much. Uh, congratu Ray is congratulating me on the birth of my son. Thank you. Aww. Okay. Um, I think this could be our last question. Uh, it's from Baby Chemist. They asked, following up <laughs> about the SoundCloud embeds, if a blog except Spotify embeds, should they still send a SoundCloud? No, I mean, usually the blogger will tell you the format that they want to have. Um, so again, you always follow the rules. We work with some and it's annoying. They want, you know, lossless flack files still to this day or like hi, they want a Dropbox with an MP3 or they want a very specific way that they like to listen to music. We even work with a few old school music journalists that still want the CD mailed to them. So however they want it, that's how you should deliver it and give it. Um, follow the rules of what the music journalist, blogger, podcaster, playlister would like. So if they want Spotify, great, give them Spotify. If they want SoundCloud, Give them, give them SoundCloud. I'd also say if they have, if they say, you know, like send us everything, then I would just send them links to Spotify, SoundCloud, you know, just to give them the option. Cause I know that some blogs have different bloggers within that. Like if it's a contact form or something, they might have multiple bloggers that prefer different platforms. This is true. So we're going to get cut off in just a couple of minutes. Um, if you have not watched part one of the Musicians Music Publicity Masterclass, please do that. That is what this whole thing is for. It's a 44 minute video. There's a bunch of action sheets to work through. We're going to be here in, a, in six days time because we missed the live stream yesterday. Thank you everyone that came back today. Uh, hashtag new mom 
didn't get it together yesterday. But I look very forward to, if you have any other questions, please hit us in our DM. Um, and we're really excited um, to be sharing this masterclass. Please, if you know of any musicians or artists or industry peeps that would benefit or would like it, it is free and it is open for the next several weeks. Um, please follow us on Instagram. We always follow back. So we will we'll be following back and um, hang in there, everyone. It's a crazy time. It's an upsetting time. Um, but it's also a time where we need you. We need artists. We need musicians. We need music. We need... We need that. So Absolutely. Don't, don't rob the world of your gifts right now. There's, it's already being robbed of so much other stuff. Yeah. Have, have a great rest of your Wednesday. Bye, guys.